Good afternoon. It's great to see all of you. You know, it's hard to be up here without feeling some humility when you consider, I know some of the backgrounds of some of you, not everyone in the room, obviously, but it looks like we have a full house. There's about 600 people here in this room. We have an overflow room, and then we have hundreds more that are dialing in over the internet. So um, a great show for this um, event. We appreciate all of you for that. You know, part of that humility comes from understanding like the journeys for most of us, whether we've been here since before America, our ancestors, or we are the newest immigrants that crossed just a few years ago. We have a unique connection to each other and to this place. And when you think about the dreams of our ancestors, it's right here in this room. It's manifesting right now. And for us, I think it would be great for at this summit that we ponder, at least for a little bit, what are our dreams for our progeny and for our country? Because we are the people that can make that happen. So welcome to the state of Latino entrepreneurship. My name is Arturo Cáceres. I'm the CEO of Elban, Latino Business Action Network. This is a very exciting time for us. As you know, we have research that we work on and then we release it once a year. We do a lot of other stuff as well. All of this is in partnership with Stanford. Um, this is our first time back to this campus since the pandemic. And so this is a great feeling for us. For me in particular, I have a very special connection to this university. When I first saw the campus, I was an 18-year-old. Um, coming from another planet. My parents had two years of grade school in Mexico. I wasn't a US citizen yet. I had been working in the fields in the Central Valley, and it was just a whole other planet. But even then, Stanford was a very special place. They created spaces that were unique and transformative across the campus. Places like El Centro Chicano, Casa Zapata, Ujama House, at these places we could see students that looked like us. They were talking big ideas about becoming doctors and lawyers and engineers and f fully participating in all aspects of the university while at the same time not attenuating any of their ethnicity. That was a very empowering four years and then later two years in, in, at the MBA program. Even then, while I couldn't fully appreciate it, I knew that I was experiencing our future. That was going to be our future in this country when we are no longer underrepresented in these spaces. That's what today is about. When you look around the room, take that with you when you leave this summit and how do we make that happen for this country everywhere? We're all gonna go back to all corners of this country. It's up to us to make it what we know the country can be for everyone that's in it. So after completing the electrical engineering degree, the MBA program, I went, had a great career in business, um, but you know, coming back has always been like a, a beautiful thing for me uh, in terms of this campus. And I really take great pride and welcome all of you to your campus. We really want you to feel connected to this university. That's a part of our mission at Stanford. Latinos are going to shape this country. I want this university to continue to be the number one institution on the planet. And it's going to do that because of you. So almost 5 million Latino businesses exist already. Latinos are opening companies faster than any other group. When we ponder just at any level, consider the potential of those businesses as they continue to grow. They're currently growing faster than the average. If the only thing we achieve is to ensure that they reach the average size of a company in this country, it's an extra several trillion dollars to the American economy. 
there's no single larger opportunity than Latinos. We are the future. It matters not just for us, but it matters for our country. We're the builders and we're here to build big. So our research ideally helps us understand that and helps us begin to unlock that potential. But together, I think if we consider this summit and what we're gonna be talking about over the course of the next few hours, we also have the potential to realize what that future can look like. We might not have all the answers when we leave here, but we can be at least asking the right questions, building the right connections, and then taking actions afterwards to try to make that future happen. The sooner we do that, the bigger this country become, becomes for everyone. For most of us, we left places that had challenges. We probably didn't want to have to do that. We were forced to do that by circumstances. And when we got here, we came here with a purpose to make sure that this place was gonna be a better place for our children and their children. We're at that moment now. For the first time, Latinos have critical mass at all levels in this country. For the first time, we're entering the professional ranks across the board. We have now that opportunity before us to begin to connect and make that impact manifest. Again, not just for us, but for the country we chose. I wanted to switch and talk a little bit about our relationship with Stanford. From the very beginning, Elban was created, and you'll hear a lot more about Elban, but we were created to empower Latino entrepreneurship across the country. And from the very beginning, the idea was to partner with this university. It so happened, and you'll hear a lot more about this, from the founder himself, um, Professor Jerry Porras. It was several of us that are Latinos from Stanford got together to try to make this thing happen, but it could not have happened without the university also meeting, more than meeting us halfway. That the university began to believe in the potential of this community and the reason for, for this partnership. The three things that we focus on, and you'll hear more about this, I'll just mention them briefly. We do the research. This is the annual event for that. We have a business scaling program with the Graduate School of Business. We bring Latino, Latina business owners from across the country. And we have now in this room probably a few Elban alumni. Let's hear from you if you're out in the audience. And across the country, there are now over 1,000 of you. And this program is still going on, so if you know other Latina or Latino business owners, please tell them about it. We don't do marketing, so we count on you to spread the good word. Let them know, and if they apply, um, it's oversubscribed, but let us know if you recommend it. Someone we want to make sure that we can um, give them every consideration. The third thing that we do is we build this ecosystem of Latino entrepreneurship across the country. That ecosystem begins with the, the people who leave our program, the, the graduates of this business scaling program. But connected to that, we have networks of mentors, networks of capital providers, bankers, VCs. We have networks of corporate partners, uh, other organizations that we work with. Um, the NMSDC, Ying McGuire is with us, um, the CEO of that organization. Uh, the USHCC, I think, uh, Ramiro is here with us. Um, so we're actively trying to build this ecosystem of Latino entrepreneurship, and every one of you in this room is a part of that. And we want you to be prescriptive about that because one of the biggest opportunities for Latinos right now at the professional level is that we build those connections. Not enough of us are connected at this level. And one big part of the summit is to accelerate that process. And so we'll have opportunities for networking and all of that kind of stuff. Um, later in the program, and tonight, if you could join us for dinner, that would also be a, a great opportunity. I also wanted to take a moment, just, um, we are a nonprofit. We depend completely on 
our sponsors. And our sponsors could range in, in every capacity, but every one of them does more than sponsor us with um, donations of, of, of financial support. They also provide mentorship, they provide their own resources, they provide programs. I wanted to mention three in particular that um, have been with us. In the case of Wells Fargo, the longest, Wells Fargo has done more than any other corporation in terms of helping l -Band get started and continuing to support us. I'm very pleased to have Jenny Flores here. Um, Patty Juarez, I'm not sure if I saw you, but I hope you made it. <laughs> um, but they have been key for our relationship and several other colleagues of theirs are here with us. But also um, Bank of America, Raquel Gonzalez, um, I hope you made it here on time, but I know several of you are here. There you are. Hi, Raquel. And several um, of her colleagues are, are here with us as well. And then the, the newest, but far from the smallest, is J.P. Morgan Chase. They have been a corporate partner most recently, but have provided incredible support. Um, Silvana Montenegro, Ted Archer, and Alejandro Manzanares, and quite a few others of, of the Chase colleagues are here with us. Um, so again, appreciate all of your support for everything that you've done for us. And now I want to bring us back to Stanford briefly as I introduce our next speaker. As I mentioned, we have a partnership with the university since the very beginning. And that partnership has grown under the leadership of President Mark Tessier Levine. We appreciate that he recognizes from the very beginning the importance of our community to the university as well as to our country. And we look forward to building a greater, stronger relationship with the university. And now for his opening remarks, I'm so very honored to invite the president of this great institution, Mark Tessier Levine, Please join me in welcoming him. Well, thank you, Arturo, for that very kind introduction. And thank you also for all of your leadership and everything that you do. Um, and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it's so great to be here. To all of you who are visiting here on campus today, welcome to Stanford. Uh, and to the annual State of Latino Entrepreneurship Summit. I'm really delighted to gather with you for today's conference uh, focused on the landscape for Latino-owned businesses today. This is a very important meeting every year. The summit provides just a terrific opportunity to gather and exchange insights with scholars, business leaders, government officials, and entrepreneurs focused on important topics related to Latino entrepreneurship. As part of today's meeting, the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative will also announce findings from the eighth annual State of Latino Entrepreneurship Report. Through this annual report, Stanford researchers and their collaborators explore the opportunities and also the challenges facing Latino entrepreneurs in the US and show how their success contributes to a stronger national economy overall. The report has really helped policymakers, industry leaders, and entrepreneurs better understand how to support and to scale Latino-owned businesses. It also provides valuable data for Latino business owners themselves who can use the findings to inform their own decision-making and their own operations. The United States, as we just heard from Arturo, is home to nearly five million Latino-owned businesses. These businesses have a huge impact on the US economy and on our society. This year's report illustrates this impact with some remarkable data. For example, Latino-owned businesses generated more than 800 billion in annual revenue and employ more than 3 million workers. They're the fastest growing segment of the US business population, as Arturo also mentioned. Between 2007 and 2019, Latino-owned businesses grew by 34%. And as the report shows, they've also outpaced both revenue and payroll growth compared to American businesses broadly. The report also demonstrates how Latino-owned businesses navigated the pandemic with remarkable resilience and examines how they fared in the post-pandemic world. Between 2019 and 2022, 
the median growth rate in revenue for Latino-owned businesses was 25%, compared to 9% for non-Hispanic white-owned businesses, which served as the benchmark comparison group for this study. Today, Latino business owners are more likely to say their businesses have recovered from the pandemic. Many Latino-owned businesses report that they've expanded their customer base to do more business with government, with corporations and nonprofits in the last two years. But Latino-owned businesses have not escaped the post-pandemic issues that all American businesses face, from economic uncertainty, to the effects of the Great Resignation, to lingering supply chain issues. Many of these issues have hit Latino-owned businesses disproportionately hard. For example, 63% of Latino-owned businesses reported challenges in retaining employees during the summer of 2022. The study also finds that Latino-owned businesses tend to secure a greater number of government and corporate contracts than white-owned businesses, but that those contracts are substantially smaller in value. Uh, those businesses also have substantially lower approval rates than white-owned businesses when applying for loans over $50,000, despite similar qualifying indicators, which of course is very troubling. It's really critical that systemic problems around financing and contracting be addressed. And I know this is going to be a focus of the meeting. Uh, that's why I'm so grateful that Slay continues to shine a light on these issues. In addition to this annual report, the SLAY Education Scaling Program helps Latino business owners enhance their networks and scale their businesses. Together, the research program and the executive education program provide a model for supporting the success of minority entrepreneurs, one that universities and organizations can follow. I'm proud of SLAY's leadership in this space, which reflects Stanford's own commitment to deploying education and research to advance equity in our society. The cornerstone at our university for that commitment is uh, our so-called IDEAL initiative. It's an acronym that stands for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access in a Learning Community. Through IDEAL, Stanford is devoting significant time, energy, and financial resources to transforming our own culture, our scholarship, and our teaching to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have the opportunity to leverage the knowledge and expertise within the Stanford community to help us understand the world around us and to provide practical solutions to address issues of inequity. In doing so, we have the potential to make profound improvements to our society. SLAY is a wonderful example of how we can make real and effective change beyond Stanford's own walls. By helping us better understand and support Latino entrepreneurs throughout the country, SLAY's work benefits both the Latino business landscape and the US economy as a whole. As this report makes clear, there is more work to be done. But I'm hopeful that, with the engagement of all of you who are here today, we can make meaningful progress in making the American business landscape more equitable for all. Before I close, I want to thank the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative and all involved in this research for their long-term commitment to improving our understanding of today's landscape for Latino entrepreneurs. I also want to thank the Latino Business Action Network and Arturo, which empowers Latino entrepreneurs across the country. Thank you to the organizers um, from SLAY, the Latino Business Action Network, and the GSB, who put this important set of discussions together. Uh, and I'm also grateful to all of today's speakers and panelists for sharing your knowledge and your insights with all of us. Thank you, everyone who's here, again, for being here today. And with that, I'll hand it off to our next speaker, Jerry Porras. Jerry is the Lane Professor of Organizational Behavior and Change Emeritus and co-founder of the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative. Please join me in welcoming Jerry Porras. As I look around the room, I, re I reflect back uh, to the year 2015, when we put on our first Seoul event. And I must say, there's been a little bit of growth. <laughs> and since we're all about growth, I think we're living our own dream. When we first did this, um, I suspect that there were maybe 150, but if I really want to exaggerate it, 200 people in the room at the time. And now it looks like we've 
at least, we've sure doubled it, maybe even tripled it, because the capacity of this place is around 600, and it's almost full. So I really, really appreciate everyone being here. I appreciate all the interest and the excitement and the energy that you bring to the table and bring to this event. Since I've been here from the beginning, I thought that it would be really useful <clears throat> to give you a perspective on why we did what we did. So, so why are we doing what we're doing? And what are we doing? And you've heard bits and pieces from uh, the two previous speakers, from Arturo and the president. But I'd like to give you a little bit more of a detail of that, because there's often a confusion about, well, there's Slay and there's Elban, and what, how do the two fit? And you know, there's Stanford. And so it's pretty clear. And as an organizational behavior person, I'm really interested in organizational structure. So I'll, uh, I'll try to elaborate exactly what we look like. But the main purpose of my comments really is to, is to lay the framework for why we're doing what we're doing. We started out, when I say we, uh, there were a group of Latino MBA alumni and myself having these conversations back in 2013, um, talking about Latinos in the US and, and how we could contribute more effectively to the success of Latinos in the US because it's really an important population, certainly for us, since we're, all, we're Latinos. And as we started that conversation, it, it, I, I would love to say that we had all this very clear in our minds. But those of you who are entrepreneurs know that at best, you have an idea in your mind, kind of an end goal. And then what it actually looks like to get there is very, very different from, uh, from where you started. So we had this, this dream that we were going to do something, and we didn't know exactly what it was. But as I look back and kind of put, put some clarity and some, some uh, analysis on what we were actually doing, even though we didn't know we were doing it, we were doing the following. We first of all began to think about Latinos as two different populations. There's the population of Latinos as individuals. They're consumers. They buy stuff. They contribute to the economy in that way. They work. They get salaries. And that's their role in the economy. And then there are Latinos as business owners. Now, everyone recognizes Latinos as consumers, but not everybody really recognizes Latinos as business owners. In fact, one of the things that often crossed my mind, and I'd like to try this little experiment with you, is if I say Latino business, what's the first type of business that pops into your mind? Restaurants, taquerias, cleaning services, gardening services. Well, that I think is a very commonly shared view of people outside of this room by far than the people inside this room, because I think you know a little bit more. <clears throat> but it is, it is a, a, a well-kept, I mean, a, just a real powerful view that, that this society has about Latino businesses. But they're out there, and we knew that they were out there, and we, and we were parts of, of them in our own experiences. So those are the two populations that we thought about. We thought about Latinos as, as individual consumers and Latino as business owners. Now the power of, actually we didn't recognize it, but the power of thinking about the world that way was that we could begin to understand that there were really two extremely powerful opportunities embedded in this framework of two populations. There was a huge opportunity that was being driven by each of those two populations. For Latinos as individual consumers, there's a huge opportunity for them to make a, a big, huge impact into the country because they buy. And 70% of our economy is driven by consumption, so they consume. Now, this year, or in 2020, Latinos made up 19% of the population. Some of these statistics, you know, you all know, but I want to kind of lay them out so we're all on the same page. <clears throat> that year, Latinos generated this 19% this of the population, these, this group of Latinos generated $2.8 trillion in GDP. $2.8 trillion. 
This is approximately 13% of the GDP. So we're 19% of the population, we're generating 13% of the GDP. If Latinos had been a country, we would have been the fifth largest economy in the world. Now that's astounding when you think about it. So the reality is that there's some magic in that number and in that thinking, and I want to build on it in just a minute. When we look at Latino population as businesses, then we find, as both Arturo and the president have stated, that there are right now about, we're, we're estimating there are about 5 million Latino owned businesses. The latest year that we have accurate data was in 2018. In 2018, there were 4.3 million Latino-owned businesses. 4.3 million in then. And they, uh, and this number, by the way, was approximately 20% of the number of, of white-owned businesses. So when you have a total number of white-owned businesses, Latinos were 20% of that larger number. That year, they generated almost $680 billion in annual revenues as a group, which was around 5% of what the white owned businesses generated. So clearly, there wasn't, there wasn't as much going on between the two populations. Now, these two sets of facts, really, if you think about them, create two dramatic opportunities. There's the opportunity that's related to the individual in the society, and the individual is a consumer. And then there's an opportunity that's related to the business side of the equation. And I want to expand a little bit on what these opportunities could look like. Clearly, the key driver for consumption amongst households is their annual income. And in 2021, the annual income of Latino households, the Latino households, was around 58,000. If you compare that to the white households, they were 71,000 a year. There's a gap. There's a gap there. If that gap were closed, if the Latino household generated as much annual income as a white household, the difference to our economy would be $179 billion. And this is when Latinos make up 19% of the population. Project into the future, well, we're projected to be 30% of the population in about 2060. If that gap persists, this economy is losing an incredible opportunity. And that's opportunity number one, is to do whatever we could to close that gap. We kind of conceptualize as increasing the wealth of Latinos. What we were trying to do is close that gap so that the average Latino household generates as much as the average white household. And the difference to the society could be clearly, clearly in the trillions of dollars in, in the, into the economy. So if we're 30% of the population and we're still having this huge gap, Who's going to suffer? Well, clearly Latinos will suffer, but everybody else is going to suffer. If 36% of your population is not consuming at a high enough level to really sustain the economy, the whole country suffers. So what we're doing is not just to benefit Latinos, and I want to make this very clear. <clears throat> what we're doing is also to benefit this country. We're doing both. And so that's what, that's what we're trying to affect and, and impact. <clears throat> so how do we close the gap? Well, there are many approaches being used right now to, to close the, the gap, and they're more indirect approaches. So there, there are programs in Latino communities and, and outside of them to uh, increase the educational opportunities for Latinos so that they can be more educated and, and get into higher position, paying positions and generate wealth that way. There are programs to improve housing. There are programs to improve health care. There are programs to reduce crime. And all of these will help the Latino communities in our country. <clears throat> but our view 
is that they're too slow. That they're not working fast enough and they're not going to work fast enough. So as a result of that, we need to do something to change that. And our answer was Latino-owned businesses, Latino entrepreneurship. So that was the next step, which if you think about it, then presents a second opportunity. When you start looking at the numbers, presents a certain, second really great opportunity. Over the last two decades, you've heard this, that Latinos have created a lot of companies at a faster rate than anybody else. The net number of Latino-owned businesses increased from around 1.5 million in 2002 to roughly five, a little over 5 million today. So the number of businesses have grown. If we start looking at, at the revenues that are generated by Latino businesses versus white-owned businesses, we see another gap that is kind of parallel to the individual household income gap. Because Latino-owned businesses have revenues that are smaller on average than white-owned businesses, this opportunity presents itself then for thinking about what if we were able to raise the average Latino-owned business to be the average, to be equal to the average white-owned business in annual revenues. So that's, that presents really just starts to define the second opportunity. In 2012, when we first started looking at these numbers, if there was a zero gap, that would have meant $1.4 trillion to the economy. That's back in 2012 when there were about 3.3 million, 2.3 million Latino-owned businesses. That would, that would have meant over $1 trillion. In 2018, which is the latest time that we have really accurate data, that closing that gap would have meant $2.1 trillion. That's in 2018. Now, the number of Latino businesses has grown by maybe a half a million in that period of time. The gap, we don't know, but we, but it, actually the gap grew from 2018, 2012, 2018. So we can expect maybe that it has grown in the interim period. But in any case, if we close that gap, the difference to the economy would be in billions, in trillions of dollars, in trillions of dollars. So that's a really big opportunity, and that's what we were focusing on, is closing that gap. So this is where, this is where Elban and Stanford come together. Because we believe that if we could do something to close the business gap, it would spill over to closing the household income gap. And I'll say a little bit about that in a, in a minute. So here's where Stanford and the GSB come in, or where Elban and the GSB come in. We formed Elban. A Latino Business Action Network is a nonprofit, and it began to drive a lot of what our thinking is all about. And then we created this collaboration with Stanford Business School, and that collaboration is SLAY. That partnership is SLAY. So our sweet spot, as we started to focus, uh, started to understand what do we want to focus on, the sweet spot that we concluded we wanted to, to really target was creating large Latino-owned businesses, not founding them. Latinos love to start businesses. <laughs> you know, and they're doing it on their own without any help. They're founding it. Now, with help, they're founding even more of them, and they're being more successful. So we didn't think that we could add a lot to that end of the, of the entrepreneurship, you know, solid company continuum. What we thought we could do is, is focus on helping companies become really big. And when I mean really big, I mean billion dollars plus. That's what we want to do. We want to help create more billion dollar plus Latino owned companies. Okay, so why do we want to do that? And how does that relate to where I started in my argument? Well, it's really the big businesses. If you look at it, with a hard light. It's really the big businesses that create a lot of jobs. I mean, that's an obvious one. What isn't as obvious is many of those jobs, not all of them, but many of the jobs would be filled by Latinos. So we provide more income for Latinos in the country. Also very importantly, Latino-owned companies tend to have more Latinos at the C-suite level. 
where now we don't see many at the C-suite level of large companies. You go to the billion dollar companies in this country, you're not gonna see many Latinos at the C-suite. So we wanna help create more of those positions through Latino businesses, and then once they have C-suite level positions there, having, getting C-suite level positions in other non-Latino corporations becomes a lot easier and it happens much more frequently. Often Latino businesses will locate some of their operations, not all of their operations, in Latino communities, and they therefore contribute to the development of that community. Very importantly, bigger Latino-owned businesses are role models for the smaller ones. They provide views of the pathways to success. And importantly, in that process, Latino-owned businesses, and one of the things we really try to promote in our program, is they do business with other Latino-owned businesses. They do business with other Latino-owned businesses. They look beyond the fact that they're Latino or that they're maybe smaller, and they'll do business with them and help them grow to be big. So doing business with each other is a key mechanism for driving this growth. All in all, if we make this happen, we create large Latino business, it'll have a huge impact on the perceptions of corporations and of individuals about the contributions Latinos are making and can make in the future. And changing those perceptions is a really key part to gaining equal access to all of the benefits that the society provides. That's why we want to focus on creating really big businesses. And so in order to do that, we said, well, hey, there's a group of, there were six of us, five MBA alums and me, who say, we formed this little, this little organization, say, how the heck are we gonna do this? And our answer was, well, we've gotta do a collaboration with Stanford. We're all, we're connected with Stanford, and we wanna do a collaboration with Stanford. But we wanted to accomplish three things very clearly, and, I think, and, and Arturo mentioned them, but I would like to elaborate on them. We had three pillars of focus. This, this we did land on very, relatively early. And those pillars were, first, we want to do foundational research. We want to create numbers. We want to create hard data that can break the stereotypes that are held by leaders in this country, both at the government and corporate levels. And we believe data is the most powerful way to, to begin that process. You have data and you have accomplishments. That's how you change things. And so we wanted to create data, because there, there weren't hard data out there that really gave the reality of what Latino businesses are like, like what industries are, there in, are we in? It turns out we're in all industries at the same rates, given our population size, as white-owned businesses. So changing those sorts of stereotypical views that people had is what we believe data would do. So we want to create research to do that. And what we're doing today is a, is a consequence of that. That's a long-term process. And we wanted to also do something that was more immediate. So we decided we want to try to intervene into the lives of Latino businesses to try to help them become these very large businesses. So we decided that what we want to do is also have a transformational education program and focus on scaling. And then the third thing is we wanted to create recognizing that the ecosystem that exists for Latino businesses is not all that supportive, we wanted to create a really empowering ecosystem to promote the growth and success of Latino businesses. That's what we, that's what we were about. Those are the three pillars, that's, that's our focus. So in order to do that, we created this, this partnership uh, with the business school, and that partnership is called SLAY. So this is the SLAY partnership, and I'm gonna very quickly just go through this just to give you an overview. LBAN creates program ideas. It, it generates funding to support the implementation of those ideas. It takes both to, to Stanford Business School and tries to talk to faculty members and get them interested in implementing those ideas. It, builds a, it provides staff support for all of the efforts that have, are going on. It builds this ecosystem, well, you've heard a little bit about, and it's gonna get stronger. It creates unique content, and also, Bottom line creates a really transformative Latino experience for the people who participate in our executive program. Stanford, on the other hand, provides faculty support, which is key. Anybody who knows about how a university works, nothing happens unless faculty want to do it. 
Okay, so trying to seduce faculty, seduce is a wrong word, convince faculty, <laughs> <laughs> convince faculty that, hey, this is an important thing to be doing, uh, is, can be challenging, but we've been successful in doing that. We've got faculty involved in the two very key roles, uh, in key roles in the two very key areas that we've had, and that's in the research and in the education. Uh, Stanford also provided the core educational content, the online program that we use for our scaling program, and also provides facilities and logistics like what we've got today. Today was, really couldn't be possible if we didn't have the, the support of Stanford uh, to, to put something like this on. And so Slay in the middle then does research, as I said, provides a scaling program, and gives us a really strong brand, which is very important, I think, in getting, gaining legitimacy in the whole society. So that's what we're about. That's why we're here. What you're going to hear today are some of the products of these efforts. And so we'll begin with the, with the research part. And I appreciate your time here. And I guess our next speaker is Paul Oyer, who's co-director of the SLAY research pro the SLAY program, period. Thank you. Always my pleasure to follow Jerry the father of Slay, um, and really the inspiration behind all of it. So welcome. It's so great to be back in person after a few years. I'm just going to show you a few things at a high level, and then I'm going to leave it to Barbara to take you a, a bit more in depth. As we've been doing every year for a while now, we did our own survey this year, and that's what led to the report you're going to read. Uh, we um, are now up to doing about 10,000 business owners. 5,000 each, Latino-owned and white-owned. It's done online through um, uh, that, some sort of uh, online um, portal. And we do it over the summer. We ask people about the performance of their business, funding, demographics, all sorts of things. And for a couple of years now, we've been doing this separately where we do the Latino-owned businesses and the white-owned business. Really important. Um, for drawing comparisons. So for years, when we were looking at just Latino-owned businesses, we didn't have as good a sense for the comparison. And that's proven invaluable over the last few surveys. And I can tell you that you know, we, on the Wednesday meetings, when we meet to discuss what the research report is going to say, often um, we'll look at the data a little bit differently. And as we've been doing the last couple of years, as we've been doing these comparisons, what I've found more often than I expected was that the two groups look pretty similar in a lot of our analyses. And I think that's heartening in a way that we found more similarity over time rather than differences. Um, but the other thing is by comparing, it gives us a chance to find what are the specific challenges of Latino entrepreneurs rather than, you know, all entrepreneurs have challenges and we can really isolate those differences now. So let me just show you a couple of graphs now I just told you how great our data set is, and I'm going to not use it for a couple of minutes here because I'm going to first tell you about some census data analyses that we did um, because that gives us the whole set of entrepreneurs in the country. Um, and it's just helpful for some big picture analysis. Most important here is just putting some perspective on things that all three, um, all of the people who went before me, all three of our speakers have already mentioned, and that is that Latino-owned businesses, the number, of, the number of businesses that are Latino-owned is growing at a faster rate than, than our white-owned uh, white businesses. So um, Latinos are growing in influence over, uh, in, as we know, in the population, in the labor market, but also as owners. They're really taking over a bigger share of ownership of American corporations or businesses. Um, and that shows up not just in the number of businesses, but also the payroll. So the contributions of these organizations or of these Latino-owned businesses to the, the incomes and the payroll of the country has been growing steadily on a, not only in an overall basis, where it's nearly doubled in the 15 years or 12 years or so of this analysis, but it's grown on a real, really significantly on a relative basis compared with white-owned businesses. Um, so that just really reiterates that the dreams that Arturo and Jerry have uh, outlined for, for the impact uh, of Latino-owned businesses, we're moving in the right direction, and, and that's great. So um, one 
as I mentioned, one thing, um, the, the headline here uh, says Latino and businesses are recovering from the pandemic at a faster rate, and I think that's a good point and it's nice. But I just want to use this as an indication of what I said before, and that is now we're back to our own data rather than the census data. And just how I think this graph does a nice job of outlining an idea I said before, and that is that on the one hand, sure, Latino businesses are recovering a little bit more. But when I look at this and I compare the um, Latino-owned businesses and the white businesses, the mo main thing I see on this graph is, you know what, the challenges and the, the rewards right now, they're not that different. And, uh, you know, the, the two groups, at least in terms of how they're recovering from the pandemic, it's, it's not that far off. So um, that, that's the number one takeaway. And then the second takeaway is to the extent there are differences, Latino businesses have been more optimistic and faster to recover from the effects of the uh, pandemic than their white-owned business counterparts. So uh, some really showing some resilience and some ability to come back. So the last graph I'll show you is, um, does show some more of a difference in terms of that recovery rate, and that is um, how, how quickly we're coming back in terms of uh, growing, how quickly the two groups are coming back in terms of growing their businesses. So um, this is in terms of revenue growth, the Latin, Latino firms are growing, um, really resumed their growth, you know, they went through some tough years and now they've really taken off again and, and we're seeing some real nice growth in both groups, but especially in the Latino group. So at a high level, as, as uh, at a high level, the state of Latino business is, is pretty good and the growth is back and uh, we're, but the challenges remain as, as we always find when we do our analysis. And so to take you through all of that in a little bit more detail, I'm gonna introduce Barbara Gomez Aguanaga. There you are. Buenas tardes a todos y todas. It's so good to see you all in person finally. And for those of you who are joining online, well, welcome from the Bay Area. And thank you, Professor Oyer, for providing an overview of the national survey and some of the trend on Latino entrepreneurship that we saw during the pandemic, as well as in the past decade and a half. As you've heard, this is the eighth annual report on the state of Latino entrepreneurship. And I'm excited to share the key findings that emerged directly from our survey, the 2022 Slate Survey on US business owners. I'm going to start by providing an overview of the key findings. Then I'm gonna expand and present data on each key point. And I'm gonna conclude with the takeaways um, and implications from our research in our growingly diverse country. And without further ado, let's jump right into the findings. The first key finding is related to funding requests. In 2022, we saw a drop in the proportion of businesses that were seeking financing relative to 2021 for both Latino and white-owned businesses. But regardless of this trend, Latino-owned businesses were more likely um, to seek financing than their white counterparts in 2022. The second finding is related to access to capital. The findings of our survey revealed that Latino-owned businesses seeking loans from national banks um, had stronger, stronger business metrics than their white counterparts. But even with these stronger business metrics, Latino-owned businesses had lower approval rates for loans that were over $50,000. And the third finding is related to government and corporate contracts. The results of our survey show that Latino-owned businesses uh, obtain substantially smaller contracts that also take longer to secure from both governments and corporations than it takes their white counterparts. So with that in mind, let's dive right into the findings uh, one by one. And I'll start with funding requests. <coughs> we saw that uh, fewer businesses sought financing in 2022. But Latinos, Latino owners, uh, business owners were more likely to request financing than their white counterparts. 
Now, I want to remind you that this finding is relevant because in 2022, one in every three Latino-owned businesses sought financing. And also, we have to remember that access to funding and financing is crucial as employer businesses emerge and they continue to recover from the pandemic, as Dr. Oyer mentioned. Now, this slide presents the change in the top forms of financing that Latino and white-owned businesses sought in 2022 compared to 2021. The blue bars correspond to white-owned uh, businesses, whereas the green bars correspond to Latino-owned businesses. At the same time, the lighter bars correspond to the proportion of businesses that sought funding in 2021, whereas the darker bars correspond to the funding that was sought in 2022. As you can see in the figure, Latino and white-owned um, employer businesses pursued substantially less financing in 2022 compared to 2021. And among all sources of financing, white-owned businesses saw a larger decrease in financing compared to white-owned businesses. Now let's take a closer look at national banks. I'm focusing on national banks because you know they're important for American businesses, obviously because they're widely known, but also because they're one of the most popular sources of financing that entrepreneurs seek. And as you can see here, from 2021 to 2022, the share of white owned businesses seeking financing from national banks decreased from 16% in 2021 to 6% in 2022, which corresponds to a 10 percentage drop point. And when we take a look at Latino-owned businesses, it went from 12% in 2021 to 9% in 2022, which corresponds to a drop of only three percentage points. The pattern we see among national banks, national bank loans, is consisting among all categories, as you can see in the figure, with white-owned businesses um, having a larger reduction in financing sought than Latino-owned businesses in 2022 relative to 2021. I want to reiterate that this trend matters because Latino and white-owned businesses sought financing in 2022 for multiple reasons, including expanding their businesses, acquiring additional capital assets, and meeting operation expenses. All of them pointing to the desire of growth despite of the pandemic and the economic uncertainty that we live in today. Key finding number two. Our research revealed that Latino-owned businesses seeking loans from national bank loans have stronger business metrics than their white counterparts but they have lower approval rates for, lo for loans over $50,000. Now, I wanna reiterate that this finding represents businesses seeking financing from national banks for three reasons. First of all, we're interested in knowing how businesses are performing uh, when they're seeking financing, which means at the time of application for loans. Second, we focus on national bank loans because they are one of the most popular forms of financing that entrepreneurs seek. And third, national banks tend to have more homogeneous parameters to evaluate businesses when seeking financing than many other forms of uh, financing. Let's start with business metrics. The figure in this slide shows the summary statistics of the business performance metrics of Latino-owned businesses relative to white-owned businesses at the time of application for, uh, from national banks. Basically, bars above one, which are presented in dark purple, indicate that Latino businesses, on average, outperform white-owned um, white businesses in a given indicator. Whereas bars below one, which are presented in lilac, imply that Latino businesses are below white businesses on that metric. As you can see here inside the red box, at the time of application to national bank loans, Latino businesses have a gross revenue that is more than three times larger on average than white-owned businesses. Now this is true in 2022 
as it is true three years before that in 2019, which, you know, these data suggest that it's not just a one-year trend, but rather a more, a more, more of a steady indicator uh, of the performance of Latino businesses that are seeking financing. Besides gross revenue, we see that on average, Latino businesses have very similar personal and business credit scores as white firms at the time of application to national banks. As you, as you know, credit scores are important to study because they are crucial metrics that can have a huge impact on businesses and loans, loan approvals. Also, as you see in the last box, red box, um, Latino-owned businesses have lower outstanding debt on average when compared to white-owned businesses. In fact, as you can see in the bar, Latino-owned businesses have about half of the outstanding debt that white firms have at the time of application to national bank loans, which again alludes to the uh, lower potential of risk among businesses from a lender perspective. Now that we know the strengths of Latino-owned businesses seeking financing from national banks, let's dive into approval rates. The graph here shows the approval rates that white and Latino-owned businesses secure from national bank loans in 2022. The blue dots correspond to white-owned businesses, the green dots correspond to Latino-owned businesses, and the line between them corresponds to the gaps of approval rates between white and Latino-owned businesses. Also, please note that the approval rates are broken down by the size of loan, as shown in the y-axis of the graph. As you can see, Latino businesses get lower approval rates than white-owned businesses when requesting loans that are over $50,000. And the gaps vary by the size of the loan. The biggest gap that we see occurs in the $50,000 to $100,000 category, with Latino firms approved on average for 40% of the amount that was originally requested, compared to 78% for white-owned firms. Now, similar trends occur in the $100,000 to $500,000 category, with Latino businesses getting 71% of the amount originally requested in this category, compared to uh, white-owned businesses getting 79% on average. The gap also happens among the largest loans. Now we're talking about uh, half a million dollars and more, with Latino firms receiving on average two-thirds of the original amount requested, compared to 85% for white-owned businesses. But when we take a look at the other side of the spectrum, now we're talking about the smallest loans, um, Latino businesses in fact receive higher approval rates than white-owned businesses that are, you know, when, we, when they request loans on their $50,000. As you can see in the bottom line, Latino firms receive on average 64% of the original amount requested in loans on their $50,000 compared to white firms receiving 49% of the original amount requested. So as you can see in the graph, there are substantive gaps in approval rates, especially among the larger loans, despite the fact that Latino-owned businesses have better metrics at the time of application to national bank loans than white businesses. Let's jump to key finding number three, which is related to government and corporate contracts. Our research revealed that Latino businesses obtain substantially smaller contracts that also take longer to secure from both corporations and governments. Now, before we move on, I want to reiterate the importance of contracts, both corporate contracts and government uh, contracts, because while not all businesses depend on these contracts uh, for their well-being and health of their businesses, these two are multi-billion dollar uh, customers. In fact, the U.S. government is the largest buyer of goods and services in the entire world. Also, when we think about contracts, government and corporate contracts can in fact enhance the predictability of revenue helping businesses make face-forward decisions, such as hiring more employees with expected revenue streams. 
So contracts, ma contracts matter, and they can have important implications for businesses and the growth um, of the U.S. economy. The findings um, of our research show that in 2022, almost one in every four Latino-owned businesses reported government and corporate contracts as important to their businesses. This is in, contract, in contrast to one in every five white-owned businesses. But again, it is not only about perceiving governments and corporations as important, it's also about actually securing contracts from them. Our findings show that 10% of all white-owned employer businesses and 13% of all employer Latino-owned businesses were able to secure at least one corporate or government contract in 2022. Basically, these findings suggest that proportionately, Latino firms are slightly more likely to receive corporate or government contracts than white-owned firms. But we know it's not only about quantities, it's also about the size and substance of those contracts. Our findings, our findings reveal that although Latino-owned businesses are slightly more likely than white businesses to secure contracts from government and corporations, Latino-owned businesses receive dramatically smaller contracts than their white counterparts. This figure here shows the average size of government and corporate contracts that Latino and white-owned businesses received in 2022. And again, this is among the 10% of white firms and 13% of Latino-owned firms that secure a corporate or government contract in 2022. And the results are remarkable. On average, Latino-owned businesses receive much smaller contracts from both governments and corporations. For example, the average size of a contract from the federal government was almost $15 million for white-owned businesses compared to half million dollars for Latino-owned businesses. Half million dollars for Latino-owned businesses. That is the equivalent of 30 times a smaller contract than white-owned businesses. Oh, not yet. The same pattern occurs for contracts from, say, from state governments, uh, with the average size of a state gov contract over, of over $20 million for white-owned businesses compared to $600,000 for Latino businesses, which is 35 times smaller on average than white businesses. A similar par pattern, but, uh, but smaller, occurs among corporate contracts. The only area where this trend is reversed is among contracts from local governments. But as we know, contracts from local governments tend to be substantially smaller than contracts coming from federal and state governments, as well as corporations. These trends are consistent across different measures of central tendency. And of course, it's not only about the size of contracts, it's also about timing. How long it takes you to finally secure a contract. Among all businesses that obtain government and corporate contracts in 2022, Latino-owned businesses experience longer negotiating periods than white-owned businesses. With more than one in every three white-owned businesses securing a government contract in less than six months, compared to one in every five Latino-owned businesses. Additionally, more Latino firms reported that it took them more than a year to close a contract um, than white-owned firms, with 37% uh, of Latino-owned businesses reporting this length, compared to only 27% to white -owned, of white-owned businesses. Similar trends occur when we talk about corporate contracts. Most white-owned businesses reported that winning a corporate contract takes them less than six months. We're talking about 50% for white-owned businesses and 40% for Latino-owned businesses. But at the same time, almost a third of Latinos, Latino-owned businesses reported that securing a corporate contract took them more than a year, compared to only 18% for white-owned businesses. Now, these double-digit gaps show that Latino-owned businesses seeking corporate and government contracts 
have to be prepared to not only receive substantially smaller contracts, but also to invest a substantial amount of time compared to their white home business counterparts. Now I know that's a lot of information and a lot, a lot to digest and take in, but I wanna close um, this portion with a brief summary of the findings. First, I wanna reiterate that Latino-owned businesses continue to play an important role in the U.S. economy. That is undeniable. Latino-owned businesses continue to grow at a faster rate in terms of number of businesses and payroll growth. Also, our research shows that Latino-owned businesses are recovering from the pandemic at a faster rate than their white counterparts. We also saw a drop in the share of white-owned businesses and Latino-owned businesses seeking financing in 2022 relative to 2021. But despite that trend, Latino-owned businesses were more likely to seek financing than white-owned businesses in 2022. Additionally, the findings of our research revealed that Latino-owned businesses seeking financing from national banks have stronger business metrics at the time of application than their white-owned business counterparts. These findings show that U.S. Latinos own very competitive and resilient businesses in America, but they continue to, change, to experience important challenges. One of them, as we discussed, is access to capital. Spe specifically, Latino-owned businesses have lower approval rates for national, banks lo national bank loans um, that are more than $50,000. Jennifer Garcia from the Latino Business Action, um, Action Network and Beto Palares from Joseph Advisory will moderate panels with scale business owners and capital providers that will dive deeper into these gaps on access to capital. So stay tuned for more information in this area. A second challenge is related to access to corporate and government contracts. With Latino-owned businesses securing substantially smaller contracts from government and corporations that also take longer to secure. Mercedes Enrique, an alum from our education scaling program who has vast experience navigating corporate um, and government contracts with, as president of the CMS Com Corporation, will moderate a panel discussion about accessing government contracts with various stakeholders. Now, I want to reiterate that Dr. Oyer and I highlighted what we believe are the most pressing findings from our report. But we got more for you. You can now access the full report on our website by scanning the QR code, and I love it that everybody has their phones out, so thank you. Or you can also visit our website at gsb.stanford.edu slash slay. I encourage you to read the report, not only to learn about growth rates, access to capital and contracts, but also to learn about additional information that we couldn't cover today, such as marketing strategies, social media usage, the great resignation, and more. With that, I'm delighted to pass the stage to John Levin, the Dean of uh, the Stanford Graduate School of Business, who will have a fireside chat with serial entrepreneur and co-founder of SuperSed, Tom Chavez. Both of them will reflect on the findings of our research from a business owner perspective and on the ground uh, perspective. So please help me welcome Dean Levin and Tom Chavez to the stage. Thank you. Well, first of all, what a, it's such a pleasure to be here. I always, this is one of my favorite events of the year. Love to, it's such a pleasure to have everyone here at the, at the business school, and particularly um, after the pandemic when we had to do this virtually for a couple of years. So it's, it's really uh, uh, just fantastic to have everyone here. So as Jerry Pora said uh, at the beginning, the, the Stanford uh, Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative, SLAY, that we run jointly with LBAN, um, has several aspects to it. Part of it is annual research, which you just heard about from Barbara and Paul. 
uh, that we're really very proud of and has had come to have quite a lot of influence with the Federal Reserve and other uh, companies and, and government agencies. And, um, and part of it is about education, practical education for entrepreneurs, uh, and um, both through the scaling program. And actually, I would just love to see, again, a show of hands of how many people in this audience have been through the scaling program. Yeah, I love that. That is amazing. And we're hugely proud of that program and the fact that we've had 1,000 entrepreneurs, uh, more than 1,000, go through it at this point. And also through just sharing ideas uh, with the whole network of, uh, of entrepreneurs that we've created. And so now we're going to transition to that part of the, of the program uh, for this afternoon's event. And I'm really um, uh, fortunate that we get to be joined and I get to have a conversation with um, I, uh, Tom Chavez, a great friend and someone I admire very much as an entrepreneur. Um, so Tom is a, a serial entrepreneur. He, in fact, I met Tom for the first time. He did not meet me at the time, probably. He, I was just one of many faces. When he had his first company, which was a software company doing pricing for advertising called Wrapped, and I was a professor, young professor at Stanford in the economics department. I was doing some consulting for Yahoo, and they were doing due diligence on his company, thinking about buying it, and I sat in on his due diligence session. They should have bought his company, but they didn't. Uh, Microsoft bought it instead. Uh, I, and never, I never knew that until right now. <laughs> there you go. We're uh, deep already. Yeah, we're, exactly. We're already discovering things. And, uh, and then he went on to found a, a, a Crux, which was, a Jerry before said, we, we want more billion dollar companies from Latino entrepreneurs. He, thank you for that one. Uh, that was great. And then, uh, and now he's uh, started Superset, which is a startup factory, really. It's, a, it's an entrepreneurial uh, uh, incubator where he is launching, uh, has been launching many, uh, many companies. Um, Tom, first of all, welcome. It's great to thank have you. Thank you. Um, you have a, quite an amazing personal story. And uh, your mom was just a force of nature. And the Chavez brothers mm -hmm. sort of, I, I think of you, you all as having kind of lived the American dream. Mm -hmm. Love to have you just maybe tell us a little bit about that and, um, and how it shaped you. Sure. Yes, my mom is, is a dynamo. My dad is, uh, is equally remarkable. Uh, the family story is that my mom, when she was younger, was uh, having a fight with one of her 10 siblings in Albuquerque, New Mexico. By the way, this is a Spanish household and there's no, they didn't have running water or you know, electricity. And, and so in a moment of peak, she yells at her older brother just to spite him. One day, I'm gonna have 10 kids and I'm gonna send them all to Harvard, which was remarkable because first, like, where does this woman in the butter even get the idea? <laughs> Of Har like, how does she even know about Harvard, right? Um, so the good Lord saw fit to only give her five kids, but she sent them all to Harvard. And uh, <laughs> so, so the, I have two older brothers, as you mentioned. I'm the middle kid, and I have two little sisters. So I have two very verbal older brothers and two little sisters with big feelings. So, <laughs> so at the dinner table, you know, it was like Wimbledon. I'm just watching back and forth. And, as everybody bats it, bats it around. But it was, um, you know, we were coming from humble circumstances. My mom and dad did not go to college. They both worked at Sandia National Labs. My mom was a secretary. My dad was a draftsman. And um, my mom always liked to strip it down and make it simple. I've said, my brothers and I have said, if, if it were today, my mom would be running Amazon with Facebook as a side hustle. She's very organized. <laughs> She's really good. And, and so she was really good at stripping things down to the bare essentials. So at, she would say three things you got to know. God, family, education, in that order. Don't forget it. So that was sort of the family mantra. It was, it was three simple things. And education was really, you know, number three. And, and so we just grew up in a house where much was expected. The bar was high. I was lucky to have two older brothers who sort of paved that path. Uh, and uh, yeah, we all just kind of got the job done. So, <laughs> so you did go to, to Harvard, and then you came here to Stanford and, right. and, and, uh, and got a PhD. And then at some point, you decided to become an entrepreneur. So how did you, you were on this great academic track, 
what, what, how did you, what took you onto this path of, of being an entrepreneur? Yeah, well, so I was here for graduate school in, in um, applied math operations research, effectively, and it became clear to me pretty early on. I thought about maybe following your path, John, and, and becoming a professor, and I realized quickly that I just probably just didn't have the temperament for it, you know, a little more restless or something. So, so I uh, decided I joined Sun Microsystems. If you're if you're really old, you might remember Sun Microsystems. <laughs> it was it was a remarkable. I was employee thirty five thousand six hundred forty two at Sun. Started and here at the GSB. That's right. That's right. Uh, one of the many many companies to come out of here, and so so I was employee thirty five thousand six hundred forty two. I was a puppy, but it was awesome because I was learning a lot. I had great management. I had great bosses. I was given a lot of opportunity, and we were doing we were applying some of the techniques that I had applied in my dissertation to pricing and procurement problems at Sun. And so this was like 95, 96, 97. And around that time, Cisco came to recruit me because they'd heard about what we were doing. And so in the way that a freshly minted PhD would do it, I looked at this and I said, well, if Sun likes this and Cisco wants it, I must have a juggernaut on my hands. Let's go start a company. Um, so that's how I decided to hung a sh hang a shingle out and got going on that first company, wrapped. And from there, it's all kind of a blur. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's unpack the blur a little bit. Uh, uh, so, um, I mean, you, 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 you've, one of the things I love about Tom is that he's a, he's a, a, he's a, he's a big LinkedIn user. I'm actually quite envious of this. He's, he has lots of followers, and he's very pithy. He gives a lot of advice out to entrepreneurs. Mm. So I, I'd love to have you maybe distill a couple of your entrepreneurial lessons. And I'm going to give you a couple of quotes that you oh have boy. posted on LinkedIn and have you maybe just sort of Tell us what they mean. Okay, so one of the ones that you that you that you shared recently is uh, is from the artist Prince, who I had not really thought of as being a, a was entrepreneurial himself actually, but I hadn't really thought of him as being an advisor to entrepreneurs. That's right. And he, he Prince said in one of his lyrics was, um, "There is joy in repetition." Yes. It's an oldie but goodie. I've accumulated these little memes and themes, um, sort of like my mom, just try to strip it down to something simple for, for people I work with. And so about 10 years ago, and this happens a lot in tech, I work in software and you have these grand concepts and you've got the math and the data and it's all, it's all really exciting. What happens though, especially as you're building a company, is that it's easy to lose the plot. And by the way, starting one of these companies from scratch is a pride swallowing, soul sucking siege. I mean, many days just suck. So you're you're just you know plowing through it. And what I was trying, what I try to do with that particular idea is let people know it's okay for us to find joy. In fact, we must find joy in doing something better, stronger, cooler every single day. It doesn't have to, every day doesn't have to be marked by these tectonic transcendental leaps. Sometimes they happen, and that's cool. Right, but I think, you know, and, and people mythologize software frequently. They read the articles, and there's so much silliness to it, really. I think, you know, I worry a lot, by the way, around here at Stanford and other places. Yes, it's cool and exciting, but I think what gets lost in the story is that, look, some days you're just waking up and busting a bunch of rocks on an interstate, and, and you're just enjoying the ride with other smart, hardworking, nice people. And I tell my friends and others who are like, hey, I'm. You know, a lot of people trying to like outsmart the VCs. I'm thinking about this company and looking at the addressable market and the blah 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 blah. Like, my own view is you should put that away, right? If you find a crew of smart, hardworking, nice people pursuing a puzzle that you find intriguing and interesting, enjoy the ride and try to find joy in repetition. Hmm. Love that. Okay, let me let me give you another one that you that you posted recently. Uh, so one of the one, one of the the axioms for entrepreneurs that you that you recently talked about was um, sometimes you need to course correct, and sometimes you need to burn the boats. Right. 
Yes. What does it mean? <laughs> okay, well, let's go back. So that was that first company that you mentioned, Wrapped, which we started as a, as a supply chain optimization company. I mentioned Sun Micros, actually Sun became a customer, Apple, Hewlett Packard. We had these big high-tech companies who were very successful com uh, customers on our platform. It became clear at a certain moment, though, that those big companies didn't want to buy innovative technology from a pipsqueak like us. And you could just, I don't know, I could just sort of see the writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. And so around that time, actually, Yahoo called and said, hey, we're constantly oversold and undersold on our ad inventory. We think maybe we could fix that somehow through pricing. And, and so we picked up the phone. I like to tell people there's this thing in advertising called CPM, cost per mile, which is like the pricing metric all advertising people pay attention to. I remember in one of those early meetings, they're saying CPM, CPM, CPM. I have no idea what CPM is, right? So we're starting from scratch. Like this is, this is gonna be, but learn fast, right? So that was the beginning of a pivot. And a lot of times in tech, people talk about you know, pivots. And, and I, actually, the thing I'm most proudest of in that from, from Wrapped is that we did make it into, I think it was Business Insider's top 10 pivots of all time. And, and the point was like, the CEO is showing up in a new market space and doesn't know like what the most basic metric actually stands for. <laughs> Houston, we've got a problem. So, so, so that was not a pivot, it was a burning of the boats. And in fact, one of our key uh, investors, and this is what VCs will do, is like focus, steady as she goes, don't get, you know, Chavez, don't, don't go chasing butterflies now. And, and so I, uh, he, he took our CFO out to breakfast and said, you gotta get Chavez to pay attention. He's, he's off the reservation, you, get, you know. Back to focus on supply chain. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, it turned out to be the right move. And, and so that was the example for us where I had to get not just our investors, but our employees, everybody like, listen, man, I'm sorry. You know, down that branch of the tree lies slow despair. On this branch of the tree lies something promising. Burn the boats. Don't. I also like to say decide is a violent word, right? It's the same root as fratricide, genocide, homicide. <laughs> People don't think about this. So decide is a violent word. And what it means is you got to put a bullet in all of those other alternatives on your decision tree, right? Choose. And, and, and that's, that's what we were trying to get at with, with burn the boats. Love it. I, so, I mean, you've had other experiences in entrepreneurship, that, that, the, your wrapped experience was one where you, you, you had to grind it out, basically, to have a, have a success. Your, your second company was sort of a rocket ship, actually. Um, I, I'd love to hear just, you, you know, having been in both those situations, a company where everything's going right, and, and then other situations where you've really just had to work every day to kind of make things happen and sort of hope that there's light at the end of the tunnel. How those compare, yeah. what it feels like, how do, you, how do you sort of manage those different situations? Right. Well, and I appreciate the question, John, because that's the through line to everything we're doing at Superset now. Because in my first company, when I was a puppy, and I really didn't know what I was doing, so I'm learning on the job. Every CEO is learning on the job, but I was really learning on the job. So, in fact, Arthur Patterson, who's a noted venture capitalist and, and the founder of Excel, was my investor. He'd come to board meetings at Wrapped, and, and he'd say, oh, so what's the business plan this month? You know, what do we, because <laughs> we're zigging and zagging, <laughs> just coasting all around, right? And so the lesson learned, and this is what we carried forward with Crux, and the reason it, it was much more of a rocket ship is that my co-founder, Vivek, whom you know, and I sat down at a kitchen table, and we just blueprinted the whole thing out, right? Like, okay, we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna do that. Do we like, no, we don't like that. Okay, so we're gonna do this, and you, know, you just talk it through, obsessively, right? So you try to blueprint the whole thing. This is the Eisenhower, all plans and models are wrong, but planning is essential, right? And, and so the lesson learned was to really try to blueprint it and think carefully about the staging and sequencing of the company, right? Fire test your assumptions and, and develop not just a hand wavy kind of plan, but a, a detailed blueprint and oh my God, what a difference it made, right? Because we actually, 
we were ready for things when, because of course you're going to get kicked in the head, right? Everything's going to wrong, go wrong. The product's going to blow up. Customers are going to freak out. Things are going to go wrong. But if you have a, a plan and a blueprint, you're kind of on that swivel and you're ready for it. So, carry, and, and it really made a difference, right? So, um, and at Superset, what we try to do now is bring that same discipline to establishing what we call the initial conditions of a company. Having learned in my first company, if you don't have the initial conditions right, you are going to zig and zag, and you have, to, you have to course correct. But if you do it sort of within an envelope of possibility and with attention to the uncertainties that you can name and how they will unfold, it turns out that you can accelerate and de-risk the journey. And that's, that's what we're proving at Superset. What do you think your superpowers are as a leader? Well, John, I'm just a guy from Albuquerque who does a thing. Um, <laughs> I don't, you know, I think from my parents I learned hard work and I, I am a competitive guy. So I do, I do tell people, you know, I haven't met anybody yet. If we're running a long marathon, because this is something that plays out over decades, I haven't met anybody yet who can outwork me. Um, so that's probably one. Um, I do think, you know, I've, I was talking about this with a friend. You know, what do you want on your gravestone? And I said, well, maybe something like, here lies Tom, you know, he made good breakfast eggs, uh, he worked hard, and was a superb collaborator. So that's what I want to be known for is I like, I like collaboration. Uh, I mean, I, I, really, I really do relish, by the way, the pandemic was terrible because I want to be in the office chopping it up and how about this and how about that and what do you think? And I love that and I think I've gotten pretty good at it. I don't, when I was a puppy also, as an engineer, you're trained to think that you should know the answer to every question. And then I realized like, no, that's not my job at all. My job is to kind of orchestrate and create the soil conditions for people way smarter than me to come in and figure it out. And so I, that's the collaboration premise for me. So if I was, having seen you in action for a number of years, I, I, w w one, of the th one of the things I would have said was that you're, you're, really, great at building te you're, you're really great at building teams and bringing a group to, around you uh, together and keeping them together. We have a lot of entrepreneurs in the audience. They all have to try to build, a, build an organization, build a team, have a leadership team, kind of win the trust and loyalty of their employees. What advice do you have about how to do that? Yeah, look, I think I see a lot of entrepreneurs, because it's hard, and, and you get nerved up, and you're not managing your own psychology effectively. So these days especially, I love to, I love to tell people, like, you've got to take care of yourself. Like, self-care, this is hard. And you can't go burning out your adrenal glands in the first year of one of these build-outs. You know, it's a, it's a marathon. So first, take care of yourself. Second, um, and speaking of teams, I think it's got to be fun. You know, we just had it. We just had it offsite uh, for Superset, and it sounded kind of weird for us to just acknowledge it. But then we just got on the table like, this just needs to be fun. Like there just needs to be joy in in the work. And and I'm kind of unabashed about because when I was younger in my career, that felt like irresponsible and kind of indulgent to say that. Now I'm just like. I, it's got to be fun. Like, there's got to be some belly laughs. There's got to be some jokes. There's got to be, because when you are going through those white knuckle moments, mm -hmm. right, you got to be able to chuckle a little bit at the absurdity of it. And so that's my other big piece of advice for entrepreneurs and employees is like, and we do this now. If you're unhappy, I've told people like, how can something I love so much make you so unhappy? That's miserable for me, right? So let's get you off the bus and help you find your professional bliss somewhere else, right? It's a job, and not every piece of every job is going to be awesome. But enjoy the ride. Try to find some joy in it. Yeah. You had we've got one more question for you. To, um, you do, recently, you had a post on LinkedIn, yet another post on LinkedIn. <laughs> I, that was about, um, that, that, was, that was actually in anticipation of this event. 
and you had a post about basically um, sort of the, the future, about investing now to have a brighter future, particularly for, for Latino business leadership and entrepreneurship. And um, love to have you just share a little of your thinking that went into that, sure. that post. Sure, sure. And listen, I mean, uh, I, it does sound a little indulgent how much I'm doing on LinkedIn, but it's the only social media I do. <laughs> <laughs> there's no Insta, there's no Facebook. Um, I find it useful, actually. So look, I think as the data is, t is indicating to all of us here today, it's vast, it's uncapped, right? The potential, the economic potential, it, you know, and just look at it the way a steely venture capitalist would. That's a big, that's a big market. It's unassailably huge. When we start companies at Superset, we're looking for market spaces that are unignorably huge. Well, this, check that box, right? Um, I think there is a social and even moral imperative, right, to harness all of the energy and all of the potential in this room and in our community to, to rise up, to create wealth for ourselves and our families and our employees. By the way, when I work with young people sometimes, and I, somebody just, uh, Martin was asking me, hey, I'm thinking about a raise and I'm feeling a little sheepish. How do, I, how do I talk about this with my boss? And he's kind of squeamish about it. And I do love to tell people like Martin, don't you apologize for wanting to create wealth for yourself. Wealth matters. Don't apologize. Create wealth for yourself. And, uh, and so, if we can, again, cultivate and actualize all of the potential in this community um, with an unabashed commitment to creating wealth, certainly for our investors, right? Because capitalism works and it matters and it's the only system that we know of that, that can harness this potential. But increasingly these days, John, it's, you know, the way we like to talk about it at Superset is not just making super rich venture capitalists a little bit richer, but actually trying to create wealth for our community and our stakeholders and our employees. And so that, that idea for me just glistens. And I think that, um, again, when you put the numbers to it, it's, it's unassailably huge. So let's go get it. Thank you, Tom Chavez. <laughs>
We always say it's a cool girls moving company because we run it with, <laughs> we run it with my little sister, Olga, who's also here. And uh, we're a federal, state, commercial, and residential moving company. Um, and we do uh, online inventory services and on-demand um, deliveries to our clients. We're based in San Francisco and Sacramento, but we can serve as the uh, entire U.S. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Steph, yeah. <laughs> My name is Saskia Sarosa. I'm the founder and CEO of Fresh Bellies, which is a line of healthy and sustainable snacks with Latin-inspired flavors. Uh, we currently sell nationwide in about 5,000 retail stores, everything from Whole Foods to Target, Sprouts, Rayleigh's Meyer. Uh, I'm originally from Ecuador, born and raised, moved to this country. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> moved to this country at the age of 17 uh, to go to college and then ended up staying here. So I, I am a first generation Hispanic immigrant. Thank you, Jennifer. My name is David Andalci. I'm the CEO of Windalco Enterprises. Uh, migrated to the United States December 13, 1975. My mother's from Venezuela. My dad's from Port of Spain, Trinidad. Living the American dream. Today, we, we have a company. I operate in 13 states. We have about 124 employees. And we have uh, projected gross revenue for 2023, about $100 million. Uh, we provide managed infrastructure services for K through 12, and we've been doing it for the past 35 years. And looking forward to. These are three different phenomenal business owners, all of whom are also graduates of the Elban Business Scaling Program right here at Stanford. David, just by observation, I think this is probably, for many reasons, the most vibrant panel that you will participate <laughs> in. Yes. But I want to start with you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just summarize the headlines right now. Latinos are starting businesses at a faster rate. They are growing revenues at a faster rate and creating more jobs at a faster rate than, than white-owned businesses. You are a business owner, multi-decade business owner. I would love to just get your macro perspective on this headline. Well, first of all, thank you for shedding the beaming light on these issues. This data is along with other data in decades. There is a, a huge disparity. And just another fact, the GDP of Latinos is surpassed the GDP of France India and the United Kingdom. How about that? I mean, we're, we're doing our thing, right? So I'm very passionate about this because with all of this data and this great data that Alban and Stanford has put forward, it just shows us of the inequities. But words without action has no meaning. What are we going to do about it? How do we make our banks accountable for access to capital? How do we make our local elected leaders accountable for fair and equal access to procurement opportunities? And I'm not just talking city, I'm talking state and I'm talking federal. So I think this is where we need to go and really, we have the data, we've done the work, now what are we gonna do about it? And I think the audience here plays a key part because by showing up today, by tuning in online, it is now all of our responsibilities to be carriers of the data, of the findings, and to keep the conversation going that would cause um, reflection, reevaluation, and ultimately action. Griselda, I want to go with you. You mentioned you, uh, you work with the federal government. I think you mentioned to me earlier that your two largest contracts are with a federal agency. Um, and many of you took a snapshot of this slide where it said the finding was that for Latino-owned businesses, the average size of federal contracts is 500,000 in comparison to 14.8 million for white-owned businesses. Tell us a little bit. One, I want to know, is that consistent with your, ex with your experience? Is that your average size of contracts? And secondly, what is the missed opportunity for you, for other Latino-owned businesses, and even the missed opportunity for the federal government? 
Yeah, so it's, it's um, pretty um, infuriating, I think, when we look at the uh, numbers. And I think we should feel, you know, yes, it's great to be together and it's great to take pictures for social media, but when we leave here, I think that we need to carry this information and continue this conversation like with, like you said, David, um, you know, the, the banks that we bank with and the people that we put in power at all levels, right, municipal, state, federal. Um, so my two largest contracts are with uh, the Veterans um, Administration. One is about a million and the other one's about 600,000 per year. Um, and, you know, that's, that's um, an anomaly, right, for a Hispanic or Latino-owned business. And they're missing out, the agencies are missing out, the uh, corporations are missing out when they don't do business with us, with a Latino owned business, knowing that you know we are resourceful, we are agile, we are um, competitive, and we're also uh, super, super um, prepared. I think when you all things equal, right? We have this fire. I, I think we're all born with this, but you know we're always trying to work harder than the next person. That's just how we are by nature. Um, on the side of the businesses. If you know that the federal government is the largest buyer of things, right, products and services, if you're not doing business with the federal government, you're missing out on opportunities. Um, and, you know, just think of like a military base, right? They're like, they're like a, a, an ecosystem. They have homes, they need painters, they need movers, they need... Um, you know, education people, all kinds of all kinds of services and products. And so, if you can sell to a commercial client or you know to a, a regular person on the street, you can sell to the federal government, and you should be trying to sell to them. Um, you know, it's our tax dollars, and um, it's it's just something that you need to pursue. And I think that we'll hear a lot of whys. You know, why you should do business with us. You know, we're um, we're here, we're ready, we're capable, all of that. But I think we also need to start thinking of why not me, right? If all things equal, why not me? I'm already selling this. Why don't I have that opportunity? And, and I think that's um, how I want to, you know, have that conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. Asking what does it take for me to get to that next level? What do you need to see from me? Um, if, you read, if you read the report in depth, it talks about, it explores different perceived success factors that Latino businesses have identified as what is important in helping them secure a government and corporate contract. And there's a number of those factors. But Saskia, let's go to you. You have already secured contracts, as you mentioned, with corporations. She didn't mention Walmart, Target, Kroger also to add to that list. But I would love to hear from your perspective, what, is, what do you perceive as helping you be successful in securing these contracts? Yeah, I think what we did early on was really lean into what we believe to be our biggest differentiating factor, which was the fact that we were Latin founded, Latin inspired flavors, something that was really culturally authentic and different than, than what was currently available in the snack space. So we walked into every meeting saying, we're Latina founded and we're minority owned, even though we weren't certified at the time. Um, but every buyer believed that and wanted to be a part of what we were building because we were already different, not just with our offering, but because you know, we were a minority founded company that was doing something differently. Um, so we leaned into that. That's really how we got all of these contracts from a, from a really early stage in the business. So to, to add to that, so one of the um, perceived factors that Latino-owned businesses identified was matchmaking opportunities. Um, matchmaking, attending matchmaking opportunities where you have the option to connect with buyers, to connect with procurement officers or supplier, or, excuse me, supplier diversity representatives. Um, that's, that's a highly perceived success factor, but it is also highly correlated with longer sales cycles. So I want to hear, Saskia, from your perspective, and Griselda, you as well, have you been to those matchmaking? Is that how you got into all of these stores? 
What's your experience with matchmaking? Go ahead, Saskia, and then we'll go to Griselda. Yeah, we didn't do any matchmaking events. So we, uh, when we first got into the, the consumer packaged goods industry and food, we learned sort of how the, how the distribution model worked and what we needed to do, what were the steps to get into these stores. And we realized uh, right from the beginning that we needed a broker that had the relationships to open the doors. And so we were fortunate enough to bring on a national broker from day one, typically you start with regional brokers, which are smaller, and then you grow into national. And we had someone, again, we lean into our Hispanic roots. We had this national broker that had major accounts that really loved what we were doing, loved that we were Latina founded. They didn't have very many of us in their portfolio and took us on. So we used them to open the doors into all of these major retailers. And that's how we got in the door with Target. Target was one of our first retailers to take the product in and to a thousand stores. Um, so we went through the broker and then just pitched that story. I want to just emphasize this because what you mentioned with that broker is that they had the internal connections. That was also a factor noted in the report, but very low for Latinos. Uh, and we could, we could infer there is that the lack of you know, that there is a lack of those internal connections, right? How do we meet the key people within the corporations that are gonna do exactly what your broker did? Mm -hmm. Griselda, let's hear your experience with matchmaking. So I, um, you know, I entered the business, it was founded in 2005. Uh, my husband was, you know, a, a packer, mover, driver, supervisor, and then he, against my advice, decided to open the business. <laughs> Um, but in 2008, I was managing about $400 million in home equity loans. And if you know, if you're old enough, you know that I was laid off and he hired me. So I'm glad that he didn't listen. But, um, but with, with that, so when I was new to the federal contracting side, I was like signing up for all matchmaking events, corporate, commercial, like anybody that knew anybody, I'm like, I, I'm in, and this is what I sell, and this is what we have, and we have the experience and all of that. And, um, you know, we're a small business, so it's three people running this company, and, you know, we have a workforce, of course, but um, I don't do matchmakings. I, I think that, and I, I say this, you know, if you're successful with that and that's work with you, good for you. But I just don't because I found early on that that's not, at least for me, from my experience, that's not how decisions were made. That's not how people were uh, buying from us. And it literally took time out of my business where I could be actually looking at sources sought, right, where you can have some input in, in, in the contract opportunities before they go out for a bit. Um, and so I just, I just don't. And that's not to say, and I know we have people here from the SBA and from many other organizations, that's not to say that they're not successful, but what I really think is that there needs to be some accountability. It's great that you have this matchmaking events and you know, it's, it's, uh, if it's um, Black History Month, they'll have like Black History events, matchmaking events, Latino, Hispanic Heritage Month, there we are again. And it's great for pictures, good for, content, but we need to be more um, aware of what opportunities are resulting from those events. And so for me, it's like, I don't do them. Show me that you're doing business with people like me and maybe I'll stop, I'll stop going to the events. Well said. I'm gonna just stick with Griselda for a moment, but I wanna switch to capital. Griselda, um, recently, in the last year, I believe, she, one, refinanced a building, an existing building, and purchased a second building. And so I would love if you could just share your experience. <coughs> did you shop it around, or how and why did you choose the bank that you did? So I'm going to have a correction for you. We bought two buildings okay. in West Sacramento. <laughs> so we have... Um, so we had, I had this experience with PPP. I didn't need PPP, right, the, the uh, payment protection thing. I didn't need it, but everybody was getting it. So I'm like, you know, I'll just do it, right? <laughs> and it took, me, it took me nine times with my national bank to apply, to submit my information. I have a degree in finance, not from Stanford, but still, a, you know, a degree in finance. And 
uh, I worked in lending, like I should know what I'm doing. My aunt who owns a um, Salvadorian restaurant in the Mission District in San Francisco, uh, very successful, she got the loan. And I'm like, how did my aunt get the loan and I didn't get the loan? <laughs> So that was like the final push that I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to get it. So anyway, so I didn't want to deal with that. Um, so through LBAN, I had a um, capital matchmaking thing that we do at, at graduation. And Elian was like, you got to meet with someone. I'm like, I don't need money. You know, this is cohort seven. Um, I don't need money. I don't like debt. I'm okay. And no, you just, you know, practice, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, fine. So I met with this person from... Um, I think it was First Bank. He's no longer there, Vicente Lopez. But um, he connected me with uh, Community Bank of the Bay and uh, Business Finance Capital. And I don't know if my banker is here, but if he is, wave and hopefully you get some business. But it was, <laughs> it was, a, um, it was a complete different experience for me because, you know, um, it wasn't as traumatic. I, I was able to secure $3.4 million for two buildings in West Sacramento. Um, so. so I'm hearing, I'm hearing experience, right? Experience, and in this case, kind of scarring experience from your PPP. But I'm hearing relationships that were built and formed even before that you needed the relationship, right? You already had the connection. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Griselda. David, I want to come to you. Right. David, very successful, mentioned to me that he's 100% self-financed, so that's remarkable. But David comes with a very interesting perspective because David sits on the board of a regional bank. So I want you, David, from that particular lens, mm -hmm. when you think about the loan approval rates that were just reported, and if I could reiterate that, Latino, Latino businesses have lower approval rates for all size of loans except for those that are 50,000 or less. One, what's happening? And then second, my second question to you is, how will you challenge the leadership of your bank so that, we, so that you can ensure equitable access to capital? I'll answer that question, but I wanna go back onto that matchmaking real quick. Okay, go right ahead. Um, I think networking is important, but you have to be specific in what you're looking for. And maybe it's on professional services or merchandising, but I think using your assist agencies, like the Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, that's led by Jaime de Palo, I think these are great resources that you can have an opportunity to market in your products. Now to get to your questions. I think everybody wants to do the right thing. I think banks wants to do the right thing. But I think they need to be educated. And we have to change the mindset. Walk into the room of a board bank. There are no minorities there, nobody looking like us. How can they attend to service our needs for capital if they don't know? We are the hardest working people. Just a little bit about the report. $50,000 loan? By the time we pay our accountants, lawyers to put that loan package together, the bill's 50,000, you have nothing, we're back at zero. <laughs> and you know, they have a fallacy. Entrepreneurs take risk, but it's not true. We don't identify with risk, otherwise we wouldn't do the things we're doing. Starting up businesses, that's what we do. We hire people to mitigate those risks. So I, I, I want to believe everyone wants to do the right thing, and I think banks need to get educated, and I think there, unfortunately, need to be compliance, maybe laws to regulate on banks and how they're lending and who they're lending and what into the communities. And it's not just banks. We're talking about procurement. We're talking about cities. We're talking about you know, all of the things that make us work. So, I, I want to stay positive with this, but we've been talking about this for decades, and we are making some change. Look at Mark Madrid at the SBA, making change, reaching out to small businesses, making sure capital is accessible. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take hard work. 
I also think there's something you say about being transparent, right? Transparent with the data, and it you know may or may not have to lead to regulation. But right. I think by data being transparent, it calls people up, it calls organizations up, it allows for candid conversations and candid questions to be asked. Last comment: the bank that I'm on. Yes. They welcome my presence. And you know why I was selected? And this is what I want to hear from more banks. We want to make a difference in the communities in which we serve. We want to make sure we're transparent in our lending practices. And we want to make sure. So that's what, that is a great start. And guess what? They just sponsored some of the largest Hispanics events in, in Chicago, and they continue to make long-term commitments. So again, I really feel that the need and the want and the initiative is there. We just have to push a little harder, and by the reports that Alban and you've put out, it's just solidifying that request. And I will say, because Alban works with the three top banks, right? And, and you can see all of our sponsors there. And because we, and I personally, am working with the teams of those three different banks, I do think that there is the intent and there is uh, the desire. And so we look forward, from our perspective, to partner in this way so that we could better support our community. Absolutely. Saskia, let's come to you. So Saskia... Um, owner of Fresh Bellies, and you, I was looking at your profile, you have already uh, received several different awards, maybe most notably is the NFL Players Association Pitch Competition. But as a startup, you need and needed uh, equity capital to grow and scale your business. And many of us in this room probably know that Latinos are significantly underinvested in. And so I would love for you to just share a little bit about your fundraising journey, where you are now with your stage of company, and what was that experience for you? Yeah, so we, I started the company um, back in 2016 with my own savings. So I took money out. I, I was a VP of marketing at the National Basketball Association at the time, decided to quit cold turkey and go start this thing with no paycheck. So I had to take money out of my 401k to get this started. Um, and... Pretty quickly into that, we were selling at farmers markets and just testing out the consumer and figuring out, is this, gonna, you know, is this a thing, is it not? And pretty quickly we realized this is not a hobby business. I really, you know, we really want this product to be available to families everywhere and we need money for that because I, I, I didn't have the money to, to fund it. Uh, and so that's, I would say six, five to six months into starting the business and selling at farmers markets, we, we, we were turning to investors to help us fund it. I did not, I mean, I wasn't born and raised here. I did not have a network of investors or high net worth individuals that I could just ask for money. And so it was a lot of research at the beginning of how, do, how does one even raise money? Because I didn't have the guidance at the time and I was really starting from scratch. Uh, and I spent a lot of time just digging into it and figuring out what's the, what's the best course of action for me now? What are my choices? What are my options? And I found that the angel route for me, where I was and with this idea that I had, was the best route. And so I applied to every single angel network in New York, and I presented to every single one of them. And through those present, you know, pitches and um, conversations, I started to expand my network. So our first two rounds of the business were 100% funded by angel networks and family offices and high net worth individuals. And it was all from this network that I started building through these pitches and presentations and picking up phone calls and trying to get to the right people. Um, we are over 90% minority owned, so all of our shareholders are either Latin, a majority of our shareholders are Latin or black or Asian, um, which is something that we really pride ourselves in. We really have diverse investors that represent our brand and who we are. Uh, and even last year when we brought in our first group of venture capital firms, one is uh, black led, which is Fearless Fund, and the other is Hispanic led, which is Vamos Ventures. So we've really also been, in, once we figured out how funding works and where we wanted to get the capital, we were very intentional about who we brought into our cap table, table to help us fund the business. 90% minority investors, that's pretty remarkable. Congratulations. I would love to hear, because I imagine you weren't only looking for minority-focused investors. 
So tell us a little bit, I would love to hear your experience. Was there a difference when you approached a traditional VC, traditional angel investor group um, versus a minority owned, or excuse me, minority focused investor? Was there a difference? And if so, what was that difference? There was absolutely a difference. I mean, we, we, did, um, we did start to build relationships in this, the regular, the traditional CP, large CPG VC funds and had conversations with them early on. And the conversations around those pitches or presentations typically revolved around, uh, you know, me and what does your husband do for a living? Who takes care of the kids? <laughs> and a lot of questions that were completely irrelevant to the business. Um, and then when I would have conversations with minority-led VC funds, it was all about the business, right? Like this idea, and what are you going to do with it? And why are you doing it? And what's your mission? And we really love that. And so. It wasn't about me personally. I think just by walking into that room, they assumed you can do this and you're the right person to do it. It was all about the business and the potential it had and the size of the market. So two completely different sets of conversation, conversations. And you know, one was obviously a lot more productive because we were going straight to what we needed to get out to determine whether or not this was going to be a fit and they were going to write us a check. I love how you said that, right? So because I heard someone in the audience once talk about um, how VCs have to make hundreds of decisions instantaneously. They're quickly making decisions all the time, how, albeit small decisions perhaps, but am I going to take this uh, conversation to the next level? And so there's all of these, you know, all of these uh, factors going into that, being a Latina, being a mom, having kids, you know, all of that plays into how someone is processing. But I appreciate for investors that could come to the table from a very neutral perspective and want to know about the business model. We are coming to the, the close of this particular panel, but if you want to meet these individuals and other Alban alumni, make sure that you stop by the expo hall on the third floor. There's a, a many other business owners that you'll have an opportunity to meet. But in closing, and we'll go Griselda down the line here, you know, look at this audience, absolutely phenomenal. We have about 700 people in person in this room, as well as our overflow room, another 500 plus uh, watching virtually, thinking about the stakeholders in the room, business owners, capital providers, mentors, uh, strategic partners. What is in you know, one brief sentence, what would be your parting message to them so that they can help you and the Latino community continue to scale their business? So we'll go with you, Griselda. So do business with us, right? Like we're capable, we're here. For me, for my business, license, insure. Um, there is always this catch-22 where it's like, well, you need experience. Well, but if you don't give me the job, then I won't have the experience. So how do I meet that performance, right, for contracting? And so do business. And um, really, for if you're an alumni here, I, I love the program, I love the people that run it, I love all of that, I love the report, but connect with your alumni network because that I think to me is the most valuable thing that we have. Uh, that you can have people like Javier Lucatero and Jaeli uh, Menenfield and all the other wonderful people that you have, I mean, you're, you know, different industries, same boat, right? Because you're, you're kind of dealing with the same issues, capital, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, I think my message to the audience would just be, uh, if you believe in what you're seeing and you really want to, to drive change, make sure you're intentional about driving that change. So we're not just to check the box, right? A lot of VCs, for example, or some of these larger institutions will take a meeting with you just to check a box and say they met with you, I met with a Latina. Make sure that there's act action in what you are doing and that you're intentional about doing it. And I think for us as a business, um, you know, what I would say is we, I am constantly building my network because I have realized that that is part of how we get to you know, succeed and, and to where we need to go. And so capital providers, investors, corporate partners, anyone who's interested in learning more about our business or how they can be supportive or we can be supportive to you, uh, happy to have a conversation. Take it away, David. Oh, absolutely. My advice, um, common sense, right? That's not so common. We have to do business with each other. 
If you want to do business with others, we have to set the example. I think that's key. We have to be focused and we have to be consistent. What is our value proposition? Understand the value proposition, the who, the what, the why. So when you go to make a presentation for a client, for a new business, you have that. Being focused, being consistent, steadfast, and educate yourself. Because getting all the money in the world, if you don't know how to spend it and be sustainable, it could be a downfall. Wonderful. Well, give it up for this wonderful panel. Thank you. Stand up, please. We're going to wrap up, but stand up, please. Stand up and stretch. I'm going to ask you, this half of the room, at the count of three, I'm going to ask you to yell out L-Ban. The other half, I'm going to ask you to yell out Stanford. Okay? And you can say L-Ban or Stanford in Spanish if you want. I don't care. Okay. Okay, orale. So... This side, Elba. One, two, three. Elba, Stanford. Elba, Stanford. Elba, Stanford. Okay. All right, you get sit down for five more minutes. Okay, I'm going to wrap up. But uh, look, what an incredible day! What an incredible turnout! Um, and so far, because there's more to be done. But, uh, you know, we heard from Stanford's 11th president, Mark Tessier-Levine. That tells you how important this is for Stanford. It's very important to us. And then, then the icon himself, Jerry Porras. <laughs> and typical Jerry, he shakes his head because he doesn't like that kind of attention. Uh, great research findings from Professor, Professor Paul Oyer and from Barbara. Thank you for all you, you presented, Barbara. I appreciate that. And then what about that fireside chat with Dean Levin and Tom Chavez? I mean, he's a poster child for Latino businesses and scaling that business, and he never forgets where he comes from. So, I mean, that's a perfect example. And then this wrap-up panel with Griselda, Saskia, and David, and then moderated by, by Jennifer. I mean, what a phenomenal panel that was. I want to tell you that we have over 700 in attendance. It's a record by three times because we have used overflow rooms as well. Two overflow rooms, so that is unbelievable attendance. So please, yeah, clap for yourselves for being here. And there's hundreds more online. So one more whoop from you all to tell them to come next year. So one, two, three. Okay. Um, you know, this is a testament to what uh, back then, Stanford President John Hennessy said 10 years ago, when Jerry and I both talked about and presented this idea of LBAN, he said, this is the right thing to be doing, this is the right time to be doing it, and Stanford is the right place to be doing it at. So visionary, this is a testament to that. Uh, you know, he believed in the vision, and we are just so thankful that, you know, Mark Tessie Levine and Dean Levin, they also believe in that because you walk on this campus with your head high. This is your place. So, um, I want to ask you, uh, who is this for? Is it for Elban? Okay. Is it for you all? Is it for the Latino community? Yeah, it's yes, but you know what? I want to reiterate what Jerry said earlier. This is for our country. This is, we are the drivers of the economy, and we should take our place at the table. Yeah, there's no more waiting around. So let's act like that, and let's walk with our heads high, okay? Okay. 
So I want to just thank a few people before we wrap up. <clears throat> Clearly all the participants I already mentioned, but we have some board members here from Elban, uh, Jerry and Arturo included, and Paul Oyer. But we also have, uh, we have Guillermo Diaz, we also have Alice Rodriguez and Rosa Santana. So, um, and so they do a lot of hard work. Uh, the L band team, by far, okay, you, you know Arturo, and you've seen Jennifer, but we also have Elian, who I'm, I know all of you have talked to, but we have Diego, we have Adrian, Lucia, Marianne, and we have also our research staff, Barbara and Jonathan. So please thank them. We also have very special thanks to the GSB team that has helped pull this together. You know, we have uh, Deb Whitman, and uh, she's right there, and uh, Tracy Rodriguez, who's been just like a ping pong ball all around, Aaron Doe, and then a special thanks to the gentleman that runs the executive education program here at Stanford, Dave Weinstein. So when all of you graduates from the program, you'll have your, 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 your certificate as an executive ed program completion. So for, thank you to Dave Weinstein. Um, and most importantly, again, thanks to all of you here or virtually for just being here and making this an incredible, not only event, but movement. So let, let's just keep that up. I, I would like you to please join us on the third floor. Uh, I think Jennifer alluded to this, for coffee and desserts, networking, an exhibitor room so that you can uh, check out uh, some of the, the, the products and services that they have. Um, and also, we're gonna have two panel discussions that were mentioned. One is on contracting, and the second one is on access to, 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 to capital. And that starts at 4 p.m. So, and they also want to kick us out of here soon, as soon as they can because there's something else going on. So I urge you to please just go upstairs. So thanks to you all. Muchas gracias. And uh, un fuerte abrazo a todos.